All right, here we are for a Make Boise Better expert interview. Um, that is where we talk to um, leaders in our community, either decision makers or experts on a topic about um, a survey that we put put to Boiseans and, and collected responses and made that public. So, so I've got Stephen Hunt with me today, um, and, and I'm going to give him an intro in a moment after I preface with what Make Boise Better is, if you're not familiar already. So I'm going to screen share and walk through that. Okay. So Make Boise Better is the easiest way to be a part of local solutions. Um, you can, there's a lot of ways you can be a part of local solutions, either through volunteering or going to city council or going to a community conversation that maybe the city is hosting. Um, but a lot of times that you got to be in a specific place at a specific time. And even if you're really interested in kind of contributing and making your voice heard, um, a lot of people are left on the sidelines. So Make Boise Better is designed to be the easiest way to be a part of those types of conversations. With five minutes or less a week, you can weigh in on surveys about important local issues, and we share the results and analysis with you later on in the week. And that helps increase community understanding and um, community problem solving. So that's what we do. Um, you can be a part of it by, um, I lost my mouse. Where's my mouse? There it is, okay. Um, you can be a part of it if you click this do your part button. We'll take you to our sign up form and then you'll get the email invitations to the surveys and the results. So I mentioned briefly that this is an expert interview. So I want to explain what that is in a little more detail. So a big reason that Make Boise Better exists is to, um, is to make people's voices heard. So it's a great thing if people's uh, points of view can be represented in some data, um, and the more the better. But people want to know that the people that are making decisions about these uh, community challenges and community solutions are hearing them. So expert interviews is one way that Make Voice You Better tries to do that. So what we do is we find um, the leaders, either the decision makers or the experts on a topic, and invite them to meet with, with me and um, talk about what we found and get their point of view, because they can help us figure out where our perceptions are in line with reality or if there's something that we're missing. So they can either reinforce our findings or set the record straight. Um, so we've done another one of those on our government survey with Dr. Jeff Lyons here, and that's what we're going to do today with Stephen. So set the stage for transportation. Um, the reason we're surveying on this is, is not only because it's important to, um, to quality of life in Boise and the Treasure Valley, it's also a big concern of the city and residents when it comes to growth. So more people moving to Boise means um, there's more cars, there's more traffic, parking's becoming more difficult. Um, and the city of Boise decided to try to get ahead of these things and, and offered up a community workshop. They've actually done several of these now. I think they're going to continue to. But the first round of them basically found that there's four themes that people are concerned about when it comes to growth. Housing affordability, transportation, cultural, environmental preservation, and governance. So over recent weeks, Make Boise Better has um, dug, tried to dig deeper on each of those themes, and this is one of those things. So we did a housing survey and analysis, transportation survey analysis, culture survey analysis, and government survey analysis. So what Stephen's going to help us with is um, the transportation survey results and talking through those. Okay, that's the context. So, so Steven's here rep um, and he works at Valley Ride. So maybe you've seen one of these uh, buses before. That's the organization that, that Steven's from. So Steven is the principal planner at um, Valley Regional Transit. And I'm gonna let him tell us a little bit more about um, 
about what his role is there. I want to go for it, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. So I work for Valley Regional Transit. I'm the principal planner there, which we do kind of the, the long range and near term planning for services that are provided through Valley Ride. So Valley Ride are the buses that you saw and the picture that you saw there. Those are the services that are operated, um, one of the set of services that are operated by Valley Regional Transit. And so my role as the principal planner is to work with both community and um, local jurisdictions on how, how they can grow and develop using public transportation as a way to, uh, to meet their goals. Um, and so I've been working in the field for about 15 years, I actually started at Valley Regional Transit back in 2003 and then went to grad school, University of Illinois in Chicago and spent the last nine years uh, working in King County, which is in the Seattle area. Oh yeah. And um, about a year and a half ago, moved back here to Boise and have been working again in Valley Regional Transit since then. So what's drawn me back is wanting to, to make the Treasure Valley a better place, um, wanting to see how we, can, how we can use public transportation to help us uh, reach our full potential as a community. Um, and I, my background actually, when I was going to school at Boise State, I was a history major. And so I sort of fell into transit as one of the things that really makes a community what it is. Uh, and, and it was through some courses in history that I understood the connection between what we call the built environment or the, the communities, the city, the streets, how all that fits together and how that influences both social and uh, cultural and, and just family norms. So to me, that's always been the interesting thing about transportation. It's, it's not about the width of the road or whether it's asphalt or concrete or the number of seats in a bus. It's what, is, what does that transportation network as a whole do for the community and how does it either reinforce or um, what, kind, what kinds of uh, actions and behaviors does that kind of transportation network reinforce and how does it help us get along as a community and and ultimately maybe most importantly uh, how does it help us fulfill our daily tasks every day right when we are trying to get to work or trying to get to the grocery store or trying to get our kids to and from their activities to get our aging parents uh, to their doctor's appointments or, or to their social events uh, all of that has to do with you know how where we are uh, in relation to the opportunities and destinations we're trying to get to Totally. So that's been my interest in public transportation and kind of how I started and came back here to Boise. Right on. Well, I'm glad you came back. You're a, you're a Boise boomeranger. I think that's what they call us. <laughs> I'm one too. Um, all right. Well, let's, let's get into some data here. See what we see. So the survey that was sent out, a copy of it's here. Um, there, so, so for everybody's reference, the survey page has all the stuff on it. So a link to the survey, um, the actual survey, the results. Um, in this case, we had a live discussion from some of our subscribers. The analysis post and the expert interview, this recording will be down here as well. So, so this survey's here. I'm not gonna go through all the questions on here because we're gonna do that in the results. Okay. So the first question I asked was, what's your primary motive of transportation? Um, and the reason I wanted to kind of start out with that is to provide some context on, are we hearing from, people's thoughts about public transit that are driving most of the time or are these people that are riding um, public transit most of the time already? That kind of puts some context on, on these responses. Um, Stephen, is this, is this representative of, uh, as far as we know, on how many people um, in Boise are driving versus these other modes? So one of the things that, that I get to do in my role is work with other agencies. So Compass is the regional metropolitan planning organization, mm -hmm. sorry, the metropolitan planning organization. Mm -hmm. So they look at these types of trends um, from a regional perspective. 
and they do have figures for uh, they call it mode share the amount of that people are choosing to either drive walk bike or use other means to get to mostly they focus on the the commute trip or the trip to how they get how people get to work um, and when we look at those you no know, this this seems to be trending a bit more towards the non-motorized forms of transportation than mm -hmm. what we see on the region. Regionally, driving is... Like 90%? Yeah. 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 Got it. 90%. And, but it, it looks to me to be about accurate in terms of the order of, of modes. So driving means okay. biking tends to... Biking and carpooling... I think it's still more people are, are biking than are using um, carpool available options. Mm -hmm. um, transit tends to be less than 1% and walking probably is underrepresented here, although I'd have to double check. But it, certainly you have on the regional perspective, more people who are driving than, right. are, than what's represented in this sample. Yeah, that makes sense because these are Boise residents that have been responding. So I would guess, you know, we've got a higher proportion of those kind of, an, kind of urban lifestyle people than potentially if you think about the whole Treasure Valley. So we've maybe got some North End people that like to work downtown. Yeah. Versus in, you know, regionally you got more, a lot more people kind of going in between cities and driving, I'd guess. And I would encourage people to look at the resources that Compass ha makes available. Um, yeah. Because there are, again, regional numbers, but I think they have sub-regional figures as well. And so I would need to go back and, and look and see what they have to say about um, either Ada County generally or yeah. maybe more specifically for mode share into downtown Boise. Are these the resources that you're talking about? Yeah. Yep. Great. So this is where that stuff is, if anybody's interested. Um, cool. Let's move on. How long is your commute to work? Um, I'm guessing this is also very um, Boise-centric view and maybe more of a downtown Boise-centric view than what you're used to seeing regionally because most of these respondents were saying really short. Yep. So this would again explain why you have the, the relatively high percent of ride, uh, people saying that they commute via bike, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, regionally, I believe the average commute length is between 20 and 30 minutes. So, uh, and that's, okay. that's the lowest one we have here. So yeah, you would see a lot more longer trips, um, across the region. You've got a lot of people who are commuting from Meridian, from Napa, Caldwell, to, to other communities, not just downtown Boise. There's quite a few um, between Napa and Meridian, Meridian mm -hmm. and, and Napa, Caldwell. Um, but the average commute time, as I recall, in the region is, is between 20 and 30 minutes. Got it. Actually, I'm curious what, the, we had all these others, I don't remember what they were. Um, no commute, work from home, don't work. Okay, these are people that Work from home or retired looks like mainly. Yeah, and so working from home is a, I mean, it, it's not a, a negligible part of what we look at when we're looking at um, travel patterns and, and commuting trips. And it's something that as a region, uh, we try and promote what they call transportation demand management or how do we get people to use the transportation network in a way that helps benefit everybody. And working from home uh, is certainly one of those hmm. options or you might uh, try and work with an employer to encourage them to have uh, policies in place that, allow, that make it easier for employees to work from home or encourage them to make investments in, in the technology that would allow employees to, to do that. Not that they always have to work from home, but be flexible yeah. with your in-office hour requirements uh, just to make it easier, not, not just for your employees, but also for everybody else who's, who's using the, the roadway network. Right. You know, I wouldn't have thought that you guys would kind of promote that because yeah. it, I mean, it makes sense. It, it takes, takes people off the road, I guess, during rush hour. Um, I guess from a 
incentive point of view, that's l potentially less ridership for you. But so you have to take a bigger picture view, like, okay, we might not get as many riders in theory, but the roads would be more like, uh, it's easier for other people to get around. That's true. Um, and that, that maybe it's reflective of, of one of the things that I think is important for a transportation agency to consider, which is what, our people don't buy transportation because they want transportation. They, they use transportation to do other things. And so our product in the end is one that is, there's a, there's an economic term for it, which I forget, but it's a, it's a product that you buy in order to enjoy or, or experience something else. Um, and so our goal in the end is to help people get to those opportunities um, and, and experience the things that they are, trying to get to more than they are to say, you need to take transit or you need to ride your bike. Um, and I think that's really important because, uh, <clears throat> is that what you were getting at with this, with this post on LinkedIn kind of, um, well, yes, in terms of, yes, in terms of what transit does, um, yeah. because off a lot of the time we might think of this gets into, I mean, there's a slightly different take on what I'm talking about here as it relates to oh, okay. because what we're talking about in this post is the fact that we might think of transit as an alternative. Uh -huh. to driving, and I think that misses the point. Um, transit isn't an alternative to driving. Transit is doing the, because that assumes that driving is the end goal. Uh, and driving isn't the end goal. Getting to where you're going is the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, going to the Boise State football game is the goal, right? Or getting to work, or those are the things that people are trying to do. And the, the means that they use to get to those opportunities or, or uh, experiences is less important by itself. What is important is that we uh, lower the cost and make it easier for people to get to more of those destinations and opportunities. That's, yeah. And when you do that, then you don't need to, it's not a culture war about modes, one mode over the other. What it's about is how do we increase the number of opportunities that are available to as many different people while lowering the cost of those, op those options. Um, and so this post is about the role that transit agencies can play in turning the discussion about what transit is doing. Transit isn't an alternative to driving. It's actually doing the very same thing that driving does, which is connect people from where they are to the opportunities that are around them. Mm -hmm. um, and when we look at it that way, then, then it opens up the, the possibilities of what transit can do, I think, to a much broader perspective. Yeah. And we think about, you know, transit only works when you've got high density. Transit only works when um, you've got really bad road congestion. And those perspectives make sense if you, if you believe that transit is only an alternative. But if you depart from the perspective that transit isn't an alternative, it's a, it is a way to get people to the destinations and opportunities that they would like to get to, then you can start to say, so what do we spend and what do we do across the region to get people to where they're going and where can transit play a role in, in maximizing people's freedom or mobility? Got it. It's a really different cool. perspective, I think. Right on. All right, let's see, what's, what's our next question? Um, how would you rate Boise's trans public transportation options? Um, so the biggest group here said fair and the next biggest said poor. Is this, you know, maybe, that, maybe this hurts um, from a value ride point of view like how, how do you think about this is this what you expected do you take take offense to this it's hard to take offense to this I think in some ways this might be a little bit generous um, okay Valley Regional Transit there when we look at how we compare to our peers um, we there is about a fifth less sorry Valley Regional Transit or Valley Ride has about one fifth of the amount of transit service for our community that communities like Reno or Spokane or even places oh. like Wenatchee have. Um, Wenatchee's not, you know, that's not a dense urban place, um, but they, 
they have about five times as much transit service per person than, than we do. Yeah. And this is the reason why I come back to that idea about freedom is we can talk about the freedom that transit provides people, but it doesn't provide any freedom without buses moving and buses moving is what we call transit operations. And that's the largest cost that transit agencies have is paying, paying for the operating of the buses. And so the freedom is directly related. The freedom the transit provides is directly related to the size of your operating budget. The bigger the operating budget, the more places you can go, the more often you can get there. Um, and the more days of the week you can, you can provide service. And that is, what we see when we look at how we compare it to just those regional peers, um, we, we don't compare favorably to the, to those. It's about money. Well, yes, it's, I mean, it's about how we spend our money. It's about how we, and what we, how we spend our money on the freedom that's important to us, the freedom, the mobility that's important to us. Um, and so that's, I mean, we can get into that a little bit more. We talk about it in Valley Connect, but that's, that's I guess, my res would be my reaction to this, is I think okay. um, if people have experienced really good public transportation when they come here, I think they would be more likely to, when they come here or when they come back here after having experienced good public transportation elsewhere, they would be more likely to say it's poor than, than even fair or good, and it's simply because there's so little of it. Um, and I think that is one of the challenges that we have right now in terms of building public support for public transportation in, in a meaningful way is that people see empty buses or don't see any buses and think that public transportation just doesn't work here. And right. what doesn't work here is the level of service that we have, not, not whether or not public transportation can actually connect people because it can and does connect people. Um, it just doesn't do it often enough to be attractive. Mm, yeah, totally. I think we got a question that kind of gets into that a little bit more down the road here. Actually, there, yep. here we go. Um, well, actually, this one is a little different than um, the reason I asked this question. If you had ideal public transportation op options, what's the most often you would probably use them? So this isn't necessarily like how often buses should run um, as much as context on I ha I wanted to get a sense of okay of all these people that are responding most of them are driving um, but if there was great public transportation would they want it would they see themselves using it at all or 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 do they just want to complain about something that they would never actually use so yeah so this is telling me that actually most people are saying and that, that by most I mean looks like about 75% or a little over that are saying, I would want to use public transportation at least once a week and maybe as much as every day. Right. Is this, uh, is this wishful thinking or is this people overreacting? They're like, yeah, I would use it if it was great, but um, I don't know, like people are complaining and saying, yeah, I would, I would back, I would back this up if I could, but, do you, do you think this is legit? I would think this is legitimate, yes. Um, and really maybe a little bit surprising that people would say that they would use it this much without having the experience of using it in the first place. And so this is one of the things that is that can be challenging. And um, what I'm saying, I guess I also want to acknowledge that there are surveys out there within uh, the Treasure Valley that suggest uh, well, where 70 plus of the survey respondents uh, say that there need to be more public transportation options within the Treasure Valley. And so that's for the last couple of years, BSU has been running their um, Treasure Valley surveys. And, and there is definite support from the public for better public transportation. Um, but oftentimes people imagine it for other people, at least because yeah. they, they don't see the route that's connecting them to the destination that they need to go to. Uh, and I think, but I think it's important. Again, the reason I come back to this concept of freedom is we don't need to do any other incentives to get people to use public transportation 
other than providing the service. Because um, again, like using the Boise State football game as an example, we don't have service that goes through the end of a football game. I mean, they sometimes get out at midnight. We don't have service that goes until midnight, but uh, people would rather be able to get to the game than have to drive to the game. And so there, the, the point is when you provide the option, people will take it. Or another way that I like to say this is people will use whatever you accommodate. And so if we, if we have lots of public transportation that is convenient, the question really becomes less, would you use it? And more, do I have a reason to travel? And if I have a reason to travel, I'm gonna then enter into the, you know, my calculation of, well, what's my best option? What's gonna save me the most money? What's gonna be the least headache? And on a lot of those fronts, public transportation has inherent uh, value or um, advantages over over driving yourself. Namely, you don't have to pay for parking. Maybe you don't have to drive. Uh, you you can do other things while you're on public transportation. You can have an extra beer too. <laughs> you can do that as well. Right? <laughs> so so there are benefits once the once the transportation is available you don't have to twist anybody's arm to to use it certainly that doesn't mean that we don't need to advertise and we don't need to raise our awareness within the community those are all things that we can do a better job of and should do a better job of but um, fundamentally i don't believe that there will be uh, a lot of incentives that you're going to need to do to get people out of their cars so to speak other than provide a reliable attractive alternative um, that gets people where they're going. They, because the underlying assumption and all that is that people are happy with their, with their current transportation options. And when you go back to the survey or the results from the public that we heard from, from that you mentioned earlier today, uh, the transportation is one of the top issues for, for the public. Mm, and, right. and it's not just the trips to work, it's the fact that for, far too many people in the Treasure Valley, every single trip that we take has to be taken in, in an automobile, um, which means you have to be, what, 16 to get your license to be able to, to do that. You have to be able to drive. And that means you end up with the sandwich generation, people taking care of kids who can't drive and people taking care of, of their older adults who can't drive as well. And all of that, all of that pressure gets put on those people who can drive and, and they are, they become the means of freedom for all, for everybody else. Right. And mm -hmm. so there are ways that, that people feel the frustrations of the, of the limiting transportation options that we have in the Valley today, every single day. And what can we do to lower those, um, lower those frustrations, make it easier for people to travel, lower the restrictions of, of travel and, and, then people will use it. So this is encouraging that you have this many people who are saying that, yeah, I could see myself riding it every day. Um, yeah. Before they even have the service available. I think typically you might see people saying they would use it every day, not that that would come after the services is provided, but this is like they would need to kind of see it to believe it, to believe it kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Okay, cool. Let's see what we have next. What is the best way to improve public transportation in Boise? So the options here are buses, more places, buses more often, circulator in Boise, and that was uh, that was an option that was being debated about, I think mainly about um, a bus around downtown um, right. that became somewhat unpopular and I think got tabled, but, um, and then a, a train connecting the Treasure Valley, it's most popular. And we've got a bunch of others here too. Let's see what we've got real quick. Better streets, ultimate goal, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, bus rapid transit, um, subway, these, okay. These look all across the board. So, um, Anything surprising here? It's not surprising. Um, the thing that we hear most about, I think, is the, wouldn't it be great if there was a train between Nampa and Boise? Mm -hmm. um, 
And so this seems consistent with the types of things that, that we hear about. Uh, I think the responses though, I mean, maybe the responses didn't allow the, the surveyor, surveyors to express it differently, but. Yeah, I believe this was, um, you had to pick, you can only pick one. Yeah. To me, prioritize the, the thing that you're trying to improve is your mobility. So what is the thing that's going to increase your mobility the most? is going to be the amount of service that's available. Um, and so number two did pretty well. Um, and number four there, the, the train is important because people see the, the freeway and they see a lot of traffic on it. And a lot of people experience the freeway on different segments of it anyways. And they say, if we had a train that was able to carry all of this traffic, that would be great. And it would be. Um, but what's, what, what you miss when you say a train between Boise and Nampa is the fact that that freeway would be doing very little if there were not arterials. Um, and so... Wait, what does that mean? So if you didn't have Eagle Road and Overland and Fairview and Garrity and... Uh, all of those, all of those connecting roads to yeah. the freeway, Broadway, Vista, then the freeway itself wouldn't be very useful. Um, or if you if you said you have to be able to walk to your destination from a freeway interchange, then you would have very few people using the freeway. Um, right. right. Be back on those local those local roads because most of the destinations are not immediately adjacent to the freeway. Yep. And so when we think about a train, especially when we think about a train, then you, you, what your, the, the roadway analog to that would be a freeway and it's a single facility and a single facility won't serve all of the needs that are in our Valley particularly well. You need to have a, a complete transportation network. Um, and so that's why I keep coming back to the way you measure that and the way to kind of, I think, simply discuss that is how much mobility does any given mode or network provide to the public? And what's the cost of providing that mobility in that way? Um, and so the best way, in my estimation, to improve public transportation in Boise is to increase the amount of public transportation that is in Boise. Um, first and foremost, and then start looking at things that help transit move faster through the roadway. So you'd be talking about it. And, and a train is simply the, the top end of the things that you can do to make public transportation move fast and efficiently, because you're, you're separating it from all the other, other traffic and you're giving it its own right of way. And you're saying, this is now going to be a really fast, convenient way for a lot of people to travel. It scales up well. Uh, you can fit lots of people in a train without having to widen the tracks uh, much much easier than you can on a with a roadway. Mm -hmm. So I think at some level, innately people are understanding that, but oftentimes I think we miss the the network that is needed to support a high capacity uh, public transportation link. Yeah, and trains. So if you uh if you were answering this survey and you could only pick one and it was about Boise, which one would, what answer would you pick here? Number two. Number two. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because, because what we hear from the people who are riding our service is, can you run the bus more often? Can you run the bus later at night? Can you run the bus on Sunday? Can you run the bus on Saturday? And all of those have to do with the frequency of, of service. Yeah. So that that's consistent with the things that we hear from our riders and and with the concept of increasing mobility. Yeah. Great. Okay, so this is a 
Um, this is a, are you going to act on this kind of question? So how, or, or putting this in context or comparing it to the other things you care about. So maybe you want better public transit, but is it one of the top things that you would vote on or, or, con, or consider a candidate based on? And the options here are it's the most important priority, a top priority, but not the most important, not very important, not at all important, or um, as a, yeah, or if you don't vote. So what do you think about this? Is, so uh, the looks like the, the uh, you know, the surface level is, Every, most people or a lot of people are saying it's important, but it's not the top thing. Um, is that what you would expect? I would read this as being encouraging that um, you have a lot of people who are saying that public transportation is, is a top priority. It's also consistent with some of the polling that was done in Meridian and in Boise about whether or not people would be willing to pay for additional uh, Transit, public transportation or if public transportation was one of their top um, transportation issues. Yeah. Um, so I think this is encouraging. And I also think though that we have room to improve on, on what are people feel, what people feel about the importance of this issue. Um, and again, I think it has to do with how, how public transportation and maybe the planning community talks about transit. The transit is an alternative. It's something for a certain segment of the population to do. Um, tends to deflate its important or tends to make it seem less important. Mm -hmm. um, but what I come back to is if you don't, if you don't give up on the idea that transit isn't, an alternative to something else, but it is a way for people to get to where they need to go, then the issue of how important is it for me to be able to get to my job? How important is it for me to be able to get to the, the different things that I'm wanting to get to throughout my day in a cost-effective and reliable way? It's surprising over my career to see how important that is to people. Um, and Typically, that falls under the realm of keeping roads clear of snow and, you know, intersections that break down. Um, because if you, if you take that away, people react really, really strongly <laughs> to their, their ability to get where they need to go. It was like Snowmageddon a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. And that definitely has political ramifications. If you, if you foul that up, people hold that against you. Mayors lose their position because they don't plow snow or plow the roads. Right. Mm -hmm. Because what you're touching on is people's ability to, to be free. It's their, it's their, their freedom. And so what I'm trying to help us do in the Valley and help other transit agencies to the extent that, that uh, they're interested in is, share that story that the what public transportation is doing is it's providing the same kind of freedom that cars provide we just have far too little of it for people to to feel that mm. which then sets up this idea of how important is it for us to be able to get to all the places we're going in a cost effective and reliable way is that a really important issue and i think right that way yeah that becomes a really important issue so the next question is how do we how do we currently spend our money to get where we're going and are there ways that we can lower those costs make it easier for more people to participate um, and I think transit has a lot to to contribute in that in that uh, sphere yeah because when we come back to what we were talking about earlier, the current scenario puts the burden of providing transportation back on individuals who have driver's licenses um, for everybody else. And it's not that, and, and people who have driver's licenses, that's certainly the majority of the adult population, but, it, and it's likely also the majority of the overall population, but there's a significant piece of the population that falls outside of that. Right. And it's a significant piece for everybody that, meaning it's an important 
part of the segment for everybody that does have a driver's license because you're talking about your kids, you're talking about your parents, you're talking about um, people with disability who you know and love, and and you are the one with the driver's license who feel that burden. Um, you're the one who's yeah. to get those people around, right? It's your problem now. Right. So, yeah. Right. And so can we provide a, a, a network or a system of transportation options that make it easier for more people to participate in, in their community? Um, and then that has other benefits because now you're talking about taking people who maybe can't hold down a, a job because they don't have reliable transportation for whatever reason. You're bringing them back into the workforce. You're helping people who otherwise can't um, drive to participate in either education or employment opportunities or just allowing yeah. them to go to the museum or whatever, you know, uh, participate in their community, which has, has other benefits that, um, that we can experience. And so it really helps everybody because even if, even if you're not the person taking it, you're not on the hook for all the opportunities for the other folks that, that you might feel some responsibility for otherwise. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think when framed that way, it, this becomes a more, a more important issue. Uh, and not just for the United States. I mean, not just for our particular community. You see this throughout the world. Um, yeah. People are willing to put up with very bad transportation options, risky, dangerous transportation options, because that transportation is their lifeline. It's their link to the rest of their life. I mean, they'll hang on the outside of trains or buses or you know, in all kinds of, of bad situations that are unsafe um, be, and uncomfortable, crowded, because what they're, what they're getting, they're not worried about buying public transportation. They're worried about getting where they're trying to go. Right. And, and you can't hold people back <laughs> from, from pursuing their life, right? Right. Um, and so that's what we're trying to tap into, I think, what I, if, if public transportation taps into that, I think we will have a much different conversation with the public about how do we think about getting around? What can we do to make it easier for more people to get around? Yeah. And lower those costs. Yeah, that's definitely a different frame of reference. That's, that's really helpful. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, well, actually, we don't need to skip it. This isn't. This was a, this was something kind of um, related, but this was something that a potential client was interested in knowing. Um, do you do you have any comments on how likely um, like people buying cars and if that's relevant to this conversation? Yeah, I think it's actually quite relevant to this conversation um, okay. because what we're talking about again is what are people willing to pay for their personal freedom. Uh, mm. And so we can't talk about that without talking about the way that we currently pay for our personal freedom and what does yeah. that cost. And so what, what drives people to buy cars typically is not because, I mean, fundamentally, it's not because they want to have a car in their driveway what drives people to drive cars is the fact that they need to get to places that they can't walk to or, or don't want to walk to or, or ride their bike to. And when you look at how automobile companies, car companies sell themselves, I mean, yeah, they show a sleek car and they show a nice interior, but what they're selling is freedom. I mean, they sell the open road. They sell, you know, I'm now in control of where I go when I, when, and getting there when I want to get there. That's what you buy when you buy a car, right? Mm -hmm. um, and why cars are so attractive. But that, uh, that cost adds up. And so it's something, so when we look at what it costs for people to pay for their own personal mobility in Ada and Canyon County, this, is, this actually is the other side of this question. It's the operating costs, not the cost of buying the car. Um, but how much do people pay for gas and insurance and, and maintenance on their vehicles every year? Total cost of ownership, yeah. Right. Excluding the capital cost. So excluding the cost of the car. So okay. don't include your car payment. How much does it cost just to move 
just just for that operating or that that uh, operating cost. Uh -huh. And it's one and a half. We estimate that it's about one and a half billion dollars a year in just Ada and Canyon County. So what that's that insane. Mean, what's that? That's insane. That's such a huge number for just our region. That is a very large number. We spend 15 million on roughly on public transportation. So we spend 1% of the total cost of our mobility on public transportation. And interestingly, public transportation's mode share is, I mean, at that small a percentage as things get funky, but it's about 1%. Um, and so what we, and yet, people talk about public transportation as being extraordinarily expensive. And Not compared to <laughs> right? one and a half billion, yeah. When, and, and oftentimes, what people will compare the costs of, of transit to is say, so I'm spending whatever a, um, a year, so maybe a city will say, I'm spending $900 a year for every rider that I get on public transportation. Why don't I just buy them a car? A cheap car. Uh, well, you could do that, but when you do that, you're you're still burdening that person with the operating cost of getting themselves around, which is actually much higher than the capital cost of buying that car in the first place. Yeah. So we can't have a conversation about the the cost of that mobility without including the private costs that all of the residents of Aiden Canyon County bear when we provide only the automobile or mostly the automobile as your as your vehicle towards your, your own personal freedom. Right. That, yeah, that's a totally different frame of reference. It's not just okay, yeah, public transportation is a oh Wookie's Wookie's got an itch. <laughs> Anybody's wondering what that was. Um, um so yeah, it's not that we're considering paying for an ex like a super expensive alternative to driving that's like maybe a backup that we don't need. It's uh, we're already spending tons and tons and tons of money on getting where we need to go and arguably the less efficient, um, less equitable version, you know, offered um, scenario. There, I, I think at a minimum, we owe it to ourselves to ask, what could we do with one and a half billion dollars a year differently? And could we provide a, a, a more equitable, more convenient uh, modes of transportation for that amount of money? Um, because, because that's, you could think of it as a tax, or that's the friction. Sometimes you think about econ or regions as, um, e economies is having friction within them, you know, goods and services move throughout a region and there's, what is the cost of moving those goods across that distance or those people across that distance? And that's what we are, what we experience, we experience that today, mm -hmm. both in terms of time loss, but also just in terms of out of pocket costs of our, our residents. And so those are costs that, that they pay willingly for their own freedom. Yeah. Um, I mean, people gripe about paying at a gas station, right? But they, they pay it because what's most important to them is being able to get to those destinations. So kind of this question combined with the previous question, people are willing to pay for their freedom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they're, they're willing to pay a whole lot for their, for their freedom. Yeah. We don't want to squeeze that turnip, you know, to make ourselves rich or anything like that. But we do want to ask the question of how can we provide more freedom to more people at a lower cost? And can public, what would public transportation look like? I mean, we don't, we don't want to say we have to have every single trip on public transportation, but how much different would public transportation in the Treasure Valley look if we had something that was not 1% of the total travel market, but let's say even just 10%, talking about $150 million in, in annual operating costs for public transportation rather than 15, 15 million. Um, so there's room for us to be thinking about how do we move around? And our goal is to 
do that in a way that lowers the cost that we're the cost that we're already spending. Yeah. Right. That's great. Let's see what we have here. Ah, we've got your question. So uh, Stephen was our sponsor on this question. Um, and this was, maybe you can remind us what the, the reason you were interested in this, in this question, but I'll go over it real quick. Under what conditions would you prioritize transit over cars on the road? Like with a dedicated lane, letting the bus go first, et cetera. So scenarios were when traffic is heavy, when the buses are full, when buses are late, always, never, or other. And this was a checkbox. So you could vote on um, multiples, I, I believe. Um, you want to, well, as you're explaining kind of what you got out of this, um, you want to remind us, um, explain kind of why this was something you wanted to know? Sure. So, Another thing that is inherent in public transportation is you can fit more people in less space than you can in, in uh, people driving their own personal vehicles. Mm -hmm. Even if all the seats in the personal vehicles were full, you can still fit more people on a bus than you can in a car in, this, in a similar amount of space. Mm -hmm. So if we, look at the, if we look at the current average auto occupancy of something around 1.2, there we could easily fit those people on a bus, one single bus that would take up 19 cars. So 19 cars or one bus, there's one bus takes up less space on the roadway. And if you have that many people on a bus, then what do you, how should that vehicle be moving through traffic? Should it move through traffic the same as every other vehicle? Or would there be things that we should do to help move those people faster because if you do that, you're able to get more carrying capacity out of the underlying infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So um, if you think of it at an, at an intersection, one bus goes through, that's like a, a stream of 19 cars going through. And so one bus can make it through an intersection in three to four seconds, 19 vehicles are gonna make it through that intersection in 20 or 30 seconds. Um, so you can get more people through the same amount of space in less time. Yeah, it's like increasing the throughput. Yes, and so when we come back to this idea of how do we move more, connect more people to more places in less, with less cost, um, if you are willing to prioritize transit, then you can, you're able to do that. You're able to move more people in less space. And so this is encouraging and it's similar. The results of this question are encouraging. Um, people, it appears, have an understanding that public transportation can move more people in less space. Um, and it's similar to the kinds of responses we got when we asked this question in our Valley Connect um, surveys about what are, what are people's willingness to, to prioritize transit movements over, over general purpose traffic. Which in the abstract, I think people can be relatively safe about saying, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. But in the, in the real-time experience, I think there's, this tends to be one of the more contentious points of public transportation. Um, you're stopped behind a bus that's stopping to load people. You want the bus to get off the road. Why are you slowing down traffic? Um, those are the types of things that, that we experience when we have transit operating in mixed traffic. Um, and so what's important for us to be able to communicate is how we're moving more people in less space and that, that they have just as much right to be in, the, in that location as other, as other vehicles. So we slow down all the time for people making right-hand turns, for people making left-hand turns, for people that stop signs, for people that stop lights. And transit vehicles is another thing that, yes, on occasion that's going to cause you to slow down. Um, and we need to have uh, uh, maybe culturally more acceptance of giving people that space. Um, and we, we accept that because we believe or we organize ourselves in such a way that it carries more people than, than everybody trying to do it in their own car. Right. Yeah. Well, we are about out of time. And that was our last chart before comments um, in here. 
So with the last minute or so, um, I want to stop this. Okay, I wanted to ask you, we had, well, thank you, first of all, like, uh, I feel like I just, I just got a tutoring session on public transportation and I got about 20 different I, points of view that I hadn't realized before. So hugely help, th um, helpful for me in understanding this. Um, do you have any takeaways from this survey? Um, you, you know, you gave a lot of great reactions. Like if, if you're, you know, you said a few times this was encouraging, like is, is there like a, something that, in summary, like uh, in response to this survey, what are you thinking? So one of the things that I think the planning community certainly can do a better job of is engaging or connecting people's ideas to actions. Uh, and one thing that, um, so there are plans out there Communities in Motion is the regional long range transportation plan. There's Valley Connect, which is Valley Regional Transit's kind of near or midterm plan out there. Um, and there are steps in those plans that need to take place for us to realize this future. And so if there's one thing that I think would be good for us all to be able to do is to, is to get a hold of the narrative around growth and transportation and the steps that need to take place by saying we aren't at there are people at the helm so to speak the there are plans in place to try and address these and but there, there are actions that need to take place we need to look at what how are we prioritizing our, our roadways what are what are the things that the communities need to be telling their local um, mayors uh, and, and other uh, highway districts and, and other political entities are important to them. Be and that we need to find ways to, to fund these changes. Um, that density isn't something that we need to be overly, con we need to be thoughtful about it. And those, but those plans exist. That there, there are plans about how density and how growth happens uh, in place. And so, all of the concerns that come up at the um, at the community conversations with the city of Boise and, and elsewhere, I feel like tend to layer on top of the, the issues that Compass and cities and BRT are trying to address. And so, but yet we too often come at this seeing each other as adversaries. And so, if there's a way that we can say we we are thinking about these things. And there are steps that we do need to take. And part of it is accepting density in certain places, uh, mitigating those impacts in smart ways, like looking at alternative forms of transportation, um, which do more than just improving that for that one location, like what we've been talking about. And not, not only does that, but it also improves all these other issues that people experience in different areas of town about the transportation options that are available to them. Um, we just need to start acting like we know uh, what we're doing and following the plans that, that are in place, holding, uh, I think, to some extent, local jurisdictions accountable for, for making, make, making action on that, taking action mm -hmm. on those things. So we will be um, talking to local jurisdictions over the, this coming year about plans to grow public transportation, which one thing that I think people typically don't understand is that's, that's actually a local jurisdiction uh, budget discussion. Our funding comes directly from the general funds of Meridian, Nampa, Boise, Caldwell, Eagle, Star. They're the ones, so those local city councils are the ones that um, decide the extent to which they're willing to pay for public transportation in their communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having some support from the community on, on those issues is important. Um, and we will be working with them on specific projects that are outlined in Valley Connect to help connect more people to more places. So Great. I guess that's kind of my, my thoughts about yeah. the, the survey and where we can go. So if this is important to you, let people know. 
Um, and yeah, we can hope and reframe the, the way you're thinking about this. This isn't just like a, an extra, a backup to driving. This is about kind of getting where you, where you need to go um, and helping people have more freedom. Right. Cool. Right. Well, Kevin, I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks a lot, Stephen. Um, you have a great day. And uh, yeah, this will be on makeboysbetter.com. Thank you very much. Yep, yeah, thanks. See ya. Bye.